Good morning, everyone. Come and take a seat if you're not already. But yes, importantly, grab your coffee first if that's what you need to get through this morning. Welcome to our first Green Wedge public lecture for 2023. As I think everyone in this room knows, but possibly not people online, we normally run a church service on Sunday mornings, but this morning is not a church service. This morning is a Green Wedge public lecture, so we warmly welcome you along. My name's Sally Agostino. I'm the pastor of Southern Cross Community Church, which is where we meet each week here, the church that meets here. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a place where genuinely you can come as you are, with your dog, with your rabbit. What other pets have we seen here? Have there been birds here, Carol? <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's a discussion for morning tea. Some recall the birds and some don't, but we won't question you, Carol. So here is a space to explore spirituality in, in a safe space. If you're watching online and you feel like coming to a church service is a bit much, just email me and we'll have coffee and we can talk spiritual things. I would love to do that. We want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people and we pay respects to elders past and present. We extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We acknowledge their living connection to country relationship with the land and with all living things. Today's lecture is a really simple format. I'm going to introduce Tim in a moment, ask him a couple of questions. Tim will have the floor uh, and then we'll have a question time. So after that's finished, you are welcome to stay for morning tea. Uh, the all important toilet conversation has to be had. So there's never a good place to put it in your introduction, but if you need to go, it's straight out those doors, women's on the left, men's on the right. I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't know that, except perhaps Tim, but now you're informed. There is colouring at the back, and you don't have to be a child to colour. And as I mentioned, there is a morning tea, which if Rosalba is in her usual form, she and Alyssa will be serving you tea, coffee, and yummy things. Now, to to put together a bio for Tim, it's more about what you, you may as well write a list of what he hasn't done than what he has. So I'm just skimming the surface of some of what Tim has done over the last, I don't want to say how many years. The Reverend Tim Costello is one of Australia's most respected community leaders and a sought after voice on social justice issues, leadership and ethics. Tim studied law and education at Monash University, followed by theology in Switzerland and later at the Melbourne College of Divinity. Tim has been Mayor of St Kilda, National President of the Baptist Union of Australia. He has been a Baptist Minister at St Kilda Baptist and Collins Street Baptist in Melbourne, as well as Executive Director of Urban Seed. I have to interject a very short story here. We was having a discussion this morning. Tim said, have I met you? I said, you won't remember. But back in about 95, we sat in the basement of Collins Street Baptist in a circle of kind of young people asking questions of Tim. And I don't, this is no disrespect to Tim, I, 30 years, I don't remember the discussion, but I do remember when a gentleman banged on the back door of the basement of uh, Collins Street, Tim, Tim, and I thought, I wonder how Tim's going to handle this when he's got a room full of people. He said, if you'll all excuse me for a moment, he went over, he knew the name of the man at the door and he helped him with whatever his need was. That went a long way. Have not forgotten that. For 13 years until 2016, Tim was Chief Executive of World Vision Australia. Other positions Tim currently holds are Senior Advisor for the Centre of Public Christianity, Chair of the Community Council of Australia and Chief Advocate of the Thriving Communities Partnership. You'll have to ask him about these things over morning tea. In 2021, he was appointed by Monash University as Chair of the Peninsula Campus Community Advisory Committee. Tim is the Executive Director of MICA Australia. He's also Director of Ethical Voice. He probably doesn't eat or sleep. Tim is spokesperson for the Alliance for Gambling Reform, which campaigns for law reform to prevent harm from poker machine gambling. In 1997, Tim was named one of Australia's 100 National Living Treasures. 
I'm sorry, but that makes you sound a little bit old, to be honest, and you're not. In 2004, was named Victorian of the Year. In 2005, was made an Officer of the Order of Australia. In 2006, Tim was named Victoria's Australian of the Year. Lastly, but not least, his books include A Lot With A Little, Faith, Hope, Streets of Hope, Finding God in St Kilda, Tips from a Travelling Soul Searcher, and Wanna Bet, Winners and Losers in Gambling's Luck Myth. What a great privilege to have you along this morning, Tim. If you would like to come up and if we can give him a warm welcome. You don't need to share a mic. Oh, good. You okay. Yeah. Yep. But I just have two questions for you. The first one is, um, that's a long bio. And I think because it's so diverse, the thread I see running through all of it is that there's always been a strong advocacy theme um, for people who are marginalised, people who don't have a voice or just don't have enough. So can you tell us, and I know I'm, I'm asking a big ask here, can you give us one example of a space project position you've been in where you thought, actually, we did, we made a, a, a difference. We significantly made a difference. If you can share one story. With us. Well, thank you. And thanks for that uh, introduction. Can you um, do the eulogy at my funeral? Uh, uh, magnificent. I'll be standing in line for that. <laughs> um, so uh, a delight to be here. Yeah, look, um, I think uh, back in year nine at school, and I went to Kerry where Howard uh, Wilkins was chaplain, well, after I'd left, uh, um, I, I asked a good question and I was surprised that in year nine I could ask a good question because uh, I didn't think I was particularly bright but I know it was a good question because the teacher was stumped and said that's a good question and I don't know the answer. <laughs> I thought teachers knew the answer and the question was essentially this, um, is poverty natural or is poverty created? If poverty is natural, you can't fight nature, you accept it. If poverty is created because of the rules that powerful and political institutions set, well, you can advocate and change the rules and include more people. And that teacher um, to, said to me, let's work on that question together outside of class time and got a few essays and articles and invested in me and uh, really set up what was the question for the rest of my life. That's why I went and did law. I thought law is about justice. I discovered laws are mainly about business and making money. And why I studied theology, because I got a bit depressed doing law, as family law and criminal law. Why I um, ended up uh, back in St Kilda with a law office in the church and then at Urban Seed as a ministry I started out of uh, Common Street Baptist where we met, um, World Vision. That question has stayed with me and it was absolutely nurtured by my faith. Uh, my faith um, uh, was reading uh, the Bible <coughs> and realising that the uh, Hebrew prophets, the Isaiahs, Amos, Micahs, who are crying justice. And it's really curious that there's an institution in a, uh, a nation, and it was also a religious nation, the Jewish nation, uh, an institution called prophets. <laughs> Most uh, nations have priests and they have rulers, but you don't have an institution actually pointing out that the kings are corrupt. And they're not looking after the widow and the stranger and the foreigner, uh, the, uh, who's the refugee in our language, and the orphan. Uh, so I realised that Jesus and Paul actually were standing within the shoes of those prophets. Mm. That there was a role, if you like, called advocacy. Mm. That it had biblical faith right at the heart of it. Um, so that question in Year 9 at Kerry that connection to the fact that there is a role for, I wouldn't put on my business tag, Tim Costello Prophet, <laughs> but actually it is a calling uh, and I think it has been the calling. Now, what was the other part of your question? Something that changed, was it? 
Yeah, what, what, name a space that you, on reflection, looking back over everything you've done, you just just want, zone in on one story, one moment where you, where you can look back and go, we genuinely made a difference. Yeah, so in, in St Kilda, uh, in the legal office, a lot of the people coming, the legal office was in the Baptist church. Um, so it's a bit unusual to go to a church to ask about your divorce or your crime or whatever it is, but that's how it was. Um, the uh, most common thing coming up were people who for generations had lived in rented workmen's cottages in St Kilda. They were poor. Uh, they at least had the beach and good public transport and St Kilda in the time we were there, we started in 1985, had been discovered. New money had poured in, why do you leave St Kilda and its boarding houses to the mentally ill and the the drug pushers and sex workers and runaway kids. Uh, we'll rebuy these mansions that are special comms. We'll make them just single family homes. And people were literally being pushed out. And I was reading Isaiah 65 and the prophet says, they shall build houses and live in them. No longer shall they build houses and others live in them. And I felt like God had spoken to me. And I said, that's what's happening here. Generations of poor, have lived here. They're all being forced out as the rent goes up, as the property prices go up. So I, with others, ran for council. I got elected as mayor. I read Isaiah 65 from uh, uh, in my robes, in my induction speech. I saw my secular mates going, oh gosh, we've got a religious nutter now. Uh, a Baptist minister as mayor reading the Bible to us. Um, <laughs> But our platform was to put ratepayers' dollars into social housing. Mm. And we became the first council in Australia to do it. Uh, housing was a state or a federal matter. Why do we have so much homelessness? Because states and feds blame each other. Mm. There's always going to be 15, maybe 20% of the population that are in insecure housing and poverty and domestic violence and mental health. Well. Melbourne has less than 4% of all its housing stock that's social housing. Because of the initiatives we took in St Kilda, nearly 15% of all housing stock in St Kilda is social housing. Mm. And that was a, a lasting, continues to be a lasting legacy, mm. I think, from um, you know, reading, reading the prophet Isaiah. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, my second question, I think you've alluded to it, how do you find the energy? I don't want to say year after year. I want to say decade after decade, but it sounds almost disrespectful <laughs> to say it. How do you find the energy and passion to persevere in what is a really difficult space? It's a fight a lot of the time. Hmm. Where does your inspiration come from? How do you find the energy to do it? Hmm. Well, thank you for uh, saying decade after decade. You're welcome. I can say yeah. the same for myself now, so <laughs> it's a good club. I, uh, I say to young people, uh, I'm so old I didn't study ancient history, I lived through it. And, and the thing is, they don't even laugh. They... <laughs> Only old people laugh. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so it, it is my faith, um, absolutely. The uh, spiritual disciplines that I learned um, at Blackburn Baptist where Howard and I grew up uh, called a quiet time and Howard's mother Lorna Wilkins was a big influence on my life. She was a very, very um, uh, wonderful spiritual woman. Those disciplines of prayer, uh, of Bible reading, of reflecting on what I can do better today, what the meaning of my life is, what God is calling me to do. Uh, uh, those nourishments have, have stayed with me. Mm. And, um, you know, at times uh, I have to, and my wife does this even better than um, me, remind myself I'm not the Messiah, uh, that <laughs> God hasn't given up on this world and I'm just to collaborate and do a little bit, but also not to feel guilty about holidays and relaxation and I play tennis twice a week. I now live in Frankston and swim right through winter. I swim every day. Mm. I, I hope it's good for me because in winter it's freezing and painful. I'm told it's good for me. So I, I don't think I've lived with uh, a sense of uh, 
it all depends on me, but that, that is a recipe for burnout. And faith, faith, I think, reminds me of two things. You know, the, the idea that you're made in the image of God, which is very important for my sense of justice, that everyone has dignity, whatever, mm. their disability, their poverty, their postcode, their sexuality, everyone carries the image of God, there's dignity. The second thing about carrying the image of God is humility. It's only the image of God. It's not God. Mm. And therefore, to actually keep reminding yourself that God is God, mm. and what you do serving others is also out of love and service to someone who's mm. God and is worthy of worship, not mm. myself. Um, you know, Kierkegaard put it beautifully. He said, the door to happiness turns outwards. That sense that it's not about me, it's about others who are made in the image of God. Uh, but Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, and yet he was the Son of God, mm. points to the fact that humans are wired to worship something. It'll be power, it'll be sex, it'll be money, it'll be... Humans will worship something. Mm. The question is, do we worship that which is worthy of worship? And being reminded it's only the image of God, we aren't God. Mm. And therefore there is humility. It's not me being the Messiah and I can, I can take a day off. Um, that, that has been really the foundations of my faith. Mm. Beautiful. And we're glad that today is not your day off. We're glad that you're here. <laughs> Thankful that you're here. And our topic of gambling and its effects, mm. and, and perhaps not more importantly, but we'd love to know what we can do. So right now the floor is yours and we are privileged to hear from you. Thanks so much, Tim. Terrific. Thank you. So, uh, as I said, a delight to be here. Uh, if uh, my wife had her way, we wouldn't be living on the beach in Frankston. We'd be living in Eltham. She loves trees. In fact, six months into uh, living down on Gould Street, uh, it's a street where there's Cannonock Creek on one side and the beach on the other. And uh, it was my dream. I, I won this, this fight for once. Um, those of you who are here know that it's actually women that make all the decisions in a marriage and <laughs> men end up, you know, going along. For once I won one decision and uh, that was being on the beach in Frankston. Uh, six months in, driving down our street, Gould Street, my wife turned to me and said, why are we living here? <laughs> she took a little while to adjust to this. She grew up in Mitcham on Cherry Tree Farm, four acres of horse and trees and... She would love to be in Eltham, but uh, for my sake, she's settled into to Frankston. Um, the, uh, the issue of uh, gambling starts like this with me. Many people say, with a reverend in front of my name, this is a moral, religious crusade. And certainly the gambling industry uh, always paints me in those terms. Curiously, it wasn't. Funnily enough, in my family history, um, my father, who uh, was brought up in a non-religious family, his father was a cockatoo and an SP bookie. A cockatoo was the person on the lookout for the police. He was also, for part of his time, an SP bookie, starting price for those who are young. You, uh, you weren't allowed to gamble unless you were at a race course under the laws uh, in Victoria and Australia. So uh, those who couldn't afford the entry price to race courses would go to the SP bookie, the starting price bookie who would give odds and he'd listen to the horse races. Uh, my father, who was never a gambler, he got converted at 19 and um, uh, became an evangelical Christian, but I noticed he loved every night watching the races. <laughs> He could always pick a, a winner. He didn't gamble, but he could always pick a winner. He lived literally just less than a kilometre from Flemington. That's where he grew up. So I remember as a child being out at my um, paternal grandparents' place. There was always beer in the fridge, the Truth newspaper, you know, <laughs> which uh, those who are old enough will remember was a scandal rag here, and the races were absolute. I didn't grow up actually thinking 
this was particularly sinful. My story with uh, gambling starts in the St Kilda Legal Office and um, a woman called Zlata Petrovich came in. She uh, was happily married with three kids, owned their own home, didn't smoke or drink uh, when pokies were introduced to uh, Victoria in 1992. She uh, started going along, now harmless recreation, weren't they? Soon she was addicted. Soon she had lost all their savings. Soon they'd had to sell the family house. She'd got another job to try and win it back, but couldn't beat the addiction of pokies. And within three years, had stolen 60 grand from her employer. And I was her lawyer. And I went along to uh, represent her in court. And she was given four years jail for stealing $60,000, which you wouldn't get today. But that was the sentence. I remember visiting her in Tarangara prison and just asking myself this question. How does a middle-aged woman who has never, ever been in trouble with the law before end up in prison for four years? How come? That's what led me to then starting to look into the pokies and going, what are these? They'd been in Sydney since 1955, and I'll get on to some of the breakthroughs we may have in the New South Wales March election coming up. Uh, but they'd been there, the only legal places in the world to gamble on pokies were Las Vegas, run by the mafia in Sydney. <laughs> And they uh, still have Vegas and Sydney or New South Wales, the most pokies anywhere in the world. They'd been in Sydney. Yeah, the, boat, the buses would go up over the border with Victorians, but they were eventually going to come to Victoria. And uh, it was Kerner that actually allowed it and the casino. She later said, the worst decision of my life. John Kane, the Labor Premier, wouldn't allow them. John Cain uh, was actually at my book launch of Wanna Bet. That was back in 2000. John Cain was there because he remembers, uh, we wrote a bit about John Wren and the power of uh, the gambling industry. Wren was the Kerry Packer of his time, bought politicians, ran uh, race courses. <coughs> he started in Collingwood, in uh, Johnson Street, uh, his tote, totalizer, which was a tea shop at the front of... Uh, um, um, Johnson Street and at the back where the tea shop came, it was a lumber yard. But funnily enough, no one ever bought tea and no one ever bought wood. <laughs> and John Wren had a, a whole book written about him by Frank Hardy, Power Without Glory, for those of you who know some of this history. Um, John Kane was at the launch. We tracked down the original site of the Johnson Street illegal tote because the numbering had all changed and we had the, uh, the uh, launch of the book there with descendants of B.A. Santa Maria, if you remember that name, Frank Hardy who wrote Power Without Glory's uh, grandkids, <laughs> John Kane, Catholics who had written Niall Brennan, histories of Archbishop Mannix, because uh, this point, this time in Victorian history, gambling absolutely had corrupted and dominated politics, and they were fascinated. Kane had watched the corruption under his father, who'd been Premier, of uh, Labor politicians by John Wren in the gambling industry. So it was a very alive story. That's why John Kane had said no to gambling and to the casinos. He'd had an inquiry, the Xavier Connor inquiry. Uh, Xavier Connor, an ex-Supreme Court judge, had said, introduce a casino and pokies and you'll get even more crime. And so Kane had said no. So he was there. John Kane's now died, but he was there at the launch of our book. Well, I started, uh, before I wrote that book, out of out of the case with Zlata Petrovich, just asking the question, what are these machines? How do they turn a law-abiding person into four years in jail? And she's middle-aged and she had no addictions. What, what, what are these? 
Long story short, I discovered that these machines uh, employ the most brilliant psychologists who design the most attractive games and the most addictive games so that when you're in front of these machines you lose all track of time and all track of the money you've lost and that if you play them regularly you will be addicted. 62 Productivity Commission reports show 62% of revenue going through Pokies machines comes from those who have uh, a gambling habit or they're developing a habit. 62%. So then I started going, well, I wonder how many Pokies we have in Australia. Peter was the treasurer at that time and the treasurer was the one who could commission productivity commission reports into and it was usually textiles and the foot industry or uh, footwear or uh, you know the manufacturing car industry and it's about efficiency and competitiveness so I had the idea and suggested to Peter the productivity commission look into gambling in Australia because I had no idea of how many pokies, or what the size was. I remember Peter saying to me, are you sure you want this? I said, why? He said, well, when the Productivity Commission looks into an area, normally its recommendations are less red tape, more deregulation, more market forces, let it rip. You know, you don't have subsidies and tariffs protect protecting industries that makes them soft. They're not economically efficient. Do you really want this? And I remember that moment. I took a deep breath thinking, do I really want this? <laughs> what if the Productivity Commission says, oh, let whatever the size of the gambling industry is in Australia, let it rip. Took a deep breath, said, yep, I want the Productivity Commission to look at this. I've been working out that these pokies seem to addict a lot of people. And I don't know what the size is. No one did. It's state-based uh, jurisdiction for pokies. Online, sports betting, we'll get to that, is federal uh, responsibility, but pokies. So in 1999, the Productivity Commission, to which I made submissions, and the industry aristocrat, uh, which is Australia's uh, gift to the world, aristocrat, <laughs> makes the most aggressive pokies anywhere in the world. Go to pokies, showrooms from America to Europe, it's always aristocrat. Billions of dollars, over $100 billion actually made by aristocrat in the last uh, decade. By the way, not one cent from aristocrat ever given back to people who are victims of pokies. Not one cent. The AGM was just last uh, Friday, and uh, Nick Xenophon, my colleague and Stephen Main and uh, Troy Stoltz who's running in, in uh, Coggera in these elections, I'll get on to him, interrogated aristocrat, uh, out came the fact not one cent, not one cent has ever give, been given back to uh, those who've suffered uh, at the hands of these aggressive machines. Aristocrats submitted to this 1999 Productivity Commission report as a lot of us did. The findings were quite extraordinary. The findings were 42.3 cents then, it's gone up, of every dollar going through a machine comes from someone who's addicted. So saying gambling responsibly is like saying use heroin responsibly. It's highly addictive. Secondly, that Australia has 20% of all the pokies in the world. <laughs> Most were in New South Wales, but Victoria, Queensland, other states catching up. We're 0.2% of the world's population. We had 20% of all the world's pokies. It discovered that pokies uh, are the crack cocaine of gambling. So if you take the $26 billion that Australians lose on gambling, on all forms of gambling at the moment, 16 billion is pokies, another 3 billion is sports betting, another 3 billion is horse racing, greyhounds, I forget the figures. Pokies is actually the lion's share. Amazingly, it found it's less than 20% of Australians that even play the pokies. 
So the losses are coming from people who are addicted, usually in the poorest postcodes. There's not many pokies in Turak. <laughs> they're in Darabin, the western suburbs, they're in Dandenong, they're in Broadmeadows, massively transferring money to the captains of gaming industry. Well, nothing really happened out of that. Though it was the Productivity Commission findings and John Howard said, I'm ashamed, this is terrible, he was Prime Minister. He then quickly added, but it's a matter for the states. Were the states ever going to do anything about this? <laughs> the states, Victoria gets about $1.3 billion a year from Pokey's uh, revenue into the Treasury, New South Wales about $3 billion. The states are Dracula in charge of the blood bank. They were never going to act. They didn't act. So in early 2007, Kevin Rund, his running as a uh, uh, Labor leader, who rings me, he said, need a policy on gambling. I said, well, promise to reinstitute the Productivity Commission to have a look at it. Nothing happened under John Howard. And Rudd does. Rudd wins. The second Productivity Commission report came down in 2010, literally the day <laughs> before Rudd was removed by Gillard. <laughs> so the whole thing got buried. The reports were even worse. The reports you know, showed the percentage of revenue going up, coming from people who are addicted, but just buried. Um, then an interesting thing happened. When Gillard won her election, Wilkie got elected as the independent, the men, member for Denison. You remember Wilkie and uh, Tony Windsor and uh, what was his name from Port Macquarie? The three independents had to decide who they were going to put into government. Would it be Abbott or would it be Gillard? Rob, Rob, what's his name? He made a... Oakshot. Oakshot. He made an 18-minute speech keeping us waiting, remember, when, as to who he's going to put in, make the Prime Minister. Wilkie's deal was, I will uh, put you in, Gillard, if you promise to bring in what's called the pre-commitment card, today we call it the cashless card, into the pokies. And Gillard agreed. And she became Prime Minister. So we really believe, we being Nick Xenophon, who was in the Senate, and Wilkie and I, we really believe we had a chance at last to reform the industry. The pre-commitments card, today in New South Wales is called the cashless card, was you couldn't play the pokies without a card. It's like a Mikey card here. Uh, before you play, you have to set your losses, and then you're locked out for a week. You set them, it's voluntary, you set them. The pre-commitment card is so important because both Productivity Commission reports had recommended it because there's a thing called the zone. You might have read the article in The Age yesterday on the pokies. Anyone see that? A few of you. Every person who's got addicted says, you have this moment of sanity before you play <laughs> where you know what the rent is this week or the food budget and you know you can't lose more than that. As soon as you're in front of the machine, you literally enter a zone. That zone is a state of hypnosis, mesmerising. We now know from the brain scans what it is. The dopamine release that hits the pleasure centre of the brain with the force of, cro of, uh, of crack cocaine actually is released with the lights, the sounds and with the utterly deceptive practices of the pokies uh, machines. These are just two of them. As soon as you press a button at the pokies, in that nanosecond you have won or lost. But what happens? Up comes one pyramid, two pyramids, three pyramids, four pyramids. You're waiting, waiting over. 
five, ten seconds, lights. And the fifth pyramid, which is jackpot, is always just above the line or just below the line. You are so close. It's called a near miss. It's a completely and utterly rigged, rigged to release the dopamine. You lost in that nanosecond. This five, ten seconds near miss is only designed for one thing, for addiction, for the dopamine release. Another deceptive practice, still on all machines, is you uh, press the button and you're playing five, six lines. You can play many lines at once with pokies. Overall, you're way down, you're losing. You have a win just on one line, but overall, the other four lines, you're down, you're way down overall. You have a win on one line, off goes all the jackpot sounds. And everyone looks at you, and they look at your machine, and some money pours out, the dopamine release. You haven't won. You're lost. But you are a winner. This powerful message that... Uh, you can be a winner, which is highly, highly addictive. Now, the pre-commitment card, very simply, says before you get in front of that machine with those addictive, attractive uh, design and misleading design features, you will have to set your loss limits and you'll be locked out for a week. Gillard and Jenny Macklin certainly were, by the time they had announced this, genuinely committed to this reform. Yes, it was Wilkie that made them do it, if they were going to secure his vote for her to be Prime Minister. But they actually had become believers. We had terrific conversations about where are all the pokies. Yep, they're all in Labor electorates. <laughs> we're just ripping off our own people for the captains of gaming industry. And I, I say captains deliberately. Those uh, clubs in New South Wales with pokies are paying, they're not-for-profit clubs, are paying salaries to their CEOs of 1.5 million. You show me a charity <laughs> paying a salary like that. And you've got there in New South Wales gold bathrooms and toilets and indoor rainforests. In pokies venues, I mean, it's surreal, it's mad. You know, and they're mini casinos. They've got the Penrith Panthers, Canterbury Bankstown. They've got 650, 700 machines. Unbelievable. Well, what happened next was Clubs New South Wales organised the un-Australian campaign. It's un-Australian to interfere with our right to gamble as we like. Alan Jones was leading it and a Catholic priest up there called Chris Riley with his... Uh, his dog collar on saying, oh, the clubs are so generous to us. Millions of leaflets with Chris Riley, Father Chris Riley's picture went out. Of course, you know, it's a bit tricky for Catholics. Catholics have pokies clubs. Archbishop Fisher, the Catholic Archbishop, is the patron of the uh, Dooley Lidicum Catholic Club with tens of millions of dollars going through. The uh, un-Australian campaign stirred up the membership of New South Wales clubs, which is millions of people in New South Wales, who even though they don't play the pokies, they get their $10 Palmer and their you know, cheap beer, and it's the local club, to say this is outrageous, this is a socialist government that is totally taking away your freedoms, even though with the card, you would you were totally free to choose what limit you wanted. So, the most hysterical campaign that I've ever seen uh, amounted. Peter Garrett, who was a minister then, as Labor and Gillard were taking a lot of heat, he and I were to debate Alan Jones at the Rabbitohs Club. Tens of thousands of people were marching and saying this is outrageous. The federal police rang both of us and pulled us out of the event. They could not guarantee our safety. We couldn't even have a debate. And I remember the moment it all fell apart. Uh, Neil Lawrence, who'd gone to Kerry with me, he made a wonderful uh, documentary called Kaching, uh, The Pokies Nation, which you can 
see. Uh, Neil was, had made it big as an advertising man. Neil had done the Kevin 07 campaign. Neil was, was often on the Gruen, some of you remember, tragically died at 60, swimming uh, on his 60th birthday in the Maldives. Um, Neil and I were in Martin Place with Andrew Wilkie. We were about to launch the pushback to the un-Australian campaign, telling Gillard and Macklin, we can win this, we can hold the line, don't go to water. Gillard, as Prime Minister, rings me, says, where are you? I say, I'm here with Wilkie and Neil, and you know, she said, can you step away? I stepped away. She was very emotional. She said, I can't withstand this. I've had Labor backbenchers marching into my office saying the heat is so great from the pokies clubs that they're going to vote for Kevin Rudd to become Prime Minister again. I have to tear up the deal with Wilkie. It was tragic because I actually think she was a believer and if she'd given us time, because Neil was a great campaigner, we might have been able to expose the lies and the hysteria of the un-Australian campaign. Of course, to tear up the deal with Wilkie, what uh, Gellard had to do was thinking he would uh, not give her his vote, because that was the deal, the pre-commitment card, the cashless card. She had to suborn a Liberal called Peter Slipper and offer him the speakership, uh, the chair, uh, speaker's role in the House of Reps. Remember this? Now, Peter Slipper was always going to be an exploding cigar. <laughs> as he proved, but he was seducible and he took that. Wilkie didn't pay out, actually, on Gillard. He didn't tear up his deal, but he and all of us were shattered. And the message to Labor was never, ever take on the pokies industry. A mistake. They're just too powerful. So after then, uh, Nick Xenophon and I, who I still talk to uh, almost every day, said, OK, we've got to work at a state level. The feds, nothing's ever going to happen there. Um, and, you know, we went back to campaigning. Um, we then had sort of little hints of uh, just how deep this is in Australian society. 20% of all the world's pokies. Then we discovered that Australia has 75% of all the world's pokies that are in pubs and clubs. Most pokies around the world are in casinos, which I don't have as much of a problem with, because a casino is destination gambling. You plan to get to Vegas, or maybe even to Crown, though Crown's three times the size of any casino in Vegas. Why am I upset with Crown? Because it's only in Australia you have massive casinos at the heart of cities. That's an Australian phenomenon. But a casino is destination gambling, and uh, uh, you've got a plan to get there, you've got a plan to get home, you thought, yeah, I'm going to have a meal, I'm going to get... When you've got 75% of all the world's pokies in pubs and clubs, it means you've got them on every third block. It means people who weren't planning to gamble, they were planning to shop. And they've got an extra half an hour on their parking meter and because they're open 24-7, oh, I'll just pop in, I've got half an hour. Accessibility, two Productivity Commission reports said, is what creates the addiction. That's what creates it. Australia has the greatest accessibility, 75% of all the world's pokies in pubs and clubs, 40% in New South Wales. The second thing we discovered was that Anthony Ball, who was then CEO of uh, Clubs New South Wales, who we'd fought, he'd come up with the un Australian campaign, now CEO of Aristocrat. Um, he and uh, the just departed uh, new CEO of New South Wales, Josh Landis, I'll come to him in a minute, in 2012 had gone to an NRA conference in America, National Rifle Association. There they were taught Guns don't kill, people kill. Never, ever blame the gun. You blame people. They came back. They devised the gamble responsibly message. They sold that message to state governments. Gamble responsibly. Most of us are responsible, for a start, 
80% don't even play the pokies. <laughs> Therefore, those that play, there are, and there's only a few of them, blame, blame, blame the individual, not the machine. What we know from all the research is it's the machine. The machine is built for addiction. The gamble responsibly message, which you've heard until you've probably had a psychic vomit, uh, is directly from the NRA. Blame the individual. The impact of that message was that people who developed a habit did not admit it. Stigma, shame, silence. It's easier to admit, far easier to admit you've got a drug problem or a mental health problem in Victoria today than a gambling problem. Why? Because you're irresponsible. The rest of us are not. You are irresponsible. Well, that NRA gift <laughs> leads me to say, if America's blind spot is uh, guns, the rest of the world looks at Australia and says, your blind spot is gambling. We not only have the greatest per capita losses of gambling in the world, they're 40% higher than the nation that comes second, which is Singapore, and then it's the Irish. 40% higher. And in Singapore, it's not Singaporeans, by the way, they're not allowed to gamble in their casinos, it's all the people flying in. So, we uh, started working, Wilkie, Nick, I and others, uh, with 60 Minutes, Nick McKenzie, they got footage out of uh, how impossibly hopeless the compliance was at Crown. You might remember the Aldi bags that under parliamentary privilege, Wilkie revealed, stacked with tens of thousands of dollars at Crown. We ended up out of that getting royal commissions, royal commissions from Perth to Melbourne to Sydney to Brisbane, now complete, all have shown two things. The casinos are utterly riddled with crime. The second thing, despite their much vaunted gold standard in helping problem gamblers, as Finkelston, the uh, Royal Commissioner here of, in Melbourne of Crown said, your so-called responsible gambling problems were the worst predatory programs I've ever seen. Loyalty programs to keep people gambling, to give them incentives. He went spare. The only thing he failed, in my view, was to say Crown should have lost its licence. Show me any other business in Australia with massive crime and the worst gambling practices, predatory, that would still be in business. What other business with a state licence would still be in business? Sadly, right up the East Coast, the same findings at Star, the same findings up there, the same outcome, but you're too big to fail. That's how powerful the gambling industry has been here in Australia. It is like banks, it is too big to fail. All of them now are in, on probation with special managers to see if they can change their DNA. Now, it's a good thing we had the Royal Commissions. The lid has been lifted. The extraordinary thing about the Royal Commission in Melbourne was it was brought on by an inquiry in Sydney. So Justice Bergen was invited to look at James Packer's Bangaroo Casino. Packer, by the way, got that licence without a tender from Liberal Premier Barry O'Farrell. Not even a tender. Alan Jones did the deal. This is how politics works with the gambling industry. And they went for a pro forma inquiry. Justice Bergen, a great judge, took the inquiry seriously. The politicians were shocked. And all her findings weren't about anything that had started in Sydney because Packer hadn't opened a Bangaroo. They're all about the findings of Packer in Crown in Melbourne. Dan Andrews was forced to have a Royal Commission here. Dan Andrews couldn't even go out and announce the Royal Commission. He sent out Melissa Horne, his gaming minister. He was so opposed to ever lifting the lid on gambling. Now, I shouldn't just pick out Dan. It's the same with Matthew Guy. I got thrown out of state parliament uh, back in 2017. I heard news that 
Matthew and Dan had done this deal. Pokey's licenses in Victoria didn't come up till 2022. This was 2017. And they'd done a deal, bipartisan deal, Guy and Dan, to extend Pokey's licenses. This is 2017. They're not up for renewal to 2022. They'd done a deal to extend them to 2045. I go in, I make a speech, I interrupt Parliament. The funny thing was they let me speak for about five minutes from the... <laughs> then, you know, the Speaker said, you know, this is so inappropriate. I'll never forget standing, in a, you know, after being thrown out, Labor women particularly coming up and looking around and saying, we agree with you. This is terrible. I didn't know in 2017, because we didn't have transparency in, uh, in uh, election laws, this only happened later, to Andrews and... The Libs credit, they did introduce transparency. That before that decision to extend them to 2024, uh, 45, Dan Andrews, Labor, received the biggest donation ever in state Labor Party history from the AHA, the Pokies Industry, Hotels Australia. $761,000 and Matthew Guy got $500,000. That's how it works. That's how it works. Well, Dan was so embarrassed by the findings of Justice Bergen, he had to have a royal commission here. And then they had to be in Perth. And this is how amazing the story is when the shocking findings of Crown were found. Who was poised to take over Crown? Who was the front runner? Star Casino in, in uh, Sydney. Until we collected information and forced a royal commission into them. And they were found to be worse than Crown. I text, you might find this, well, a friend of mine texts uh, and I see them. You'll find this surprising with James Packer still. James Packer actually has a point. He says, you know, Star were even worse <laughs> than what they found against me. They were. And yet they were the clean skin about to buy Crown until we had a royal commission there. Nick McKenzie, Channel 9, 60 Minutes, Nine Papers. Without them, we wouldn't have lifted these lids. So, let me bring it back down, finish to New South Wales. How long have I been going? A bit long by the look of it. <laughs> okay, let me finish in New South Wales. New South Wales is the belly of the beast. I had been working here with our strength for the Alliance for Gambling Reform. If the question is, what can you do? Get onto the website of the Alliance for Gambling Reform. That's where we tell the stories of what we're doing, sign petitions, add your voice. If you can, donate. We're an organisation of less than half a million dollars a year up against a $26 billion a year profit-making organisation. That's profit, by the way, $26 billion. In New South Wales, their turnover each year, just from pokies, is 95 billion turnover. 95 billion. Buys a lot of media and a lot of politicians. Well, in New South Wales, uh, I formed a friendship with Dom Perrottet. And Easter last year, he started speaking at Wesley Mission about the social misery. And he said, I know I'm a state treasurer, I know the billions are easy, but I don't feel right. We had never heard a Premier talk like this, ever. And we started working with him and he commissioned quietly a crime commission, the New South Wales Crime Commission, to investigate pokies. We knew that casinos exist for laundering huge amounts of dirty money. What would be happening at suburban pokies? October last year, the New South Wales Crime Commission brought down its report. Billions of dollars of dirty money going through suburban pokies, right through New South Wales. The people selling drugs to our kids, burgling our houses with hot goods, uh, needing to actually have a story for the police, go load it up, and load $10,000 cash in one go. Get some losses, whatever it is, get a check, they're clean, can explain that, oh, to the police I've been at the pokies. Billions of dollars. What that did was suddenly change the game. Because no longer was pokies just about a few pathetic individuals. You don't have to gamble. The industry said, you know, you're not responsible. Suddenly it was about all of us. Billion, in New South Wales, billions of dollars of crime money going through pokies. 
This dramatically, Dan Andrews, by the way, won't call a crime commission in Victoria, <laughs> though we've been calling for it. He knows what it, it would discover. So that, uh, that uh, New South Wales belly of the beast started to crack just because there was a Premier who showed some backbone. And I remember in one conversation with Perrottet explaining the NRA connection, I said, you know, it's really a case that regulation hasn't kept up with technology. When pokies were coin operated, you couldn't do a lot of damage. You put your two shillings in, your poor, you know. What happened in the 90s was they went digital. You can load up $10,000 cash in one go, lose money. I said, this is the NRA example. Tongue in cheek, I said, I agree with the Second Amendment. I believe in America, every American has a right to a ball and musket rifle. But when the technology suddenly is semi-automatics and you're claiming a Second Amendment written back in the, uh, what was it, 18th, 17th century, 18th century, Perrottet got that straight away. He said, of course. They are massively dangerous and regulation hasn't kept up. Perrottet then became the first Premier in, or Opposition Leader in New South Wales not to sign an MOU with Clubs New South Wales. Every leader in all the last elections signs up three months out before a state election. We won't change taxes on pokies, change any regulation. You tell me any vested interest in Australia that gets MOUs before an election. The reason is they run the state. $95 billion turnover, they run the state. Chris Minns, the Labor leader, then had to be shamed into not signing it and didn't. Then we worked with Perrottet and three, four weeks ago he announced his policy a cashless card because the nationals are so captured by the gaming industry. It wasn't perfect. It should be legislating the cashless card for all pokies in the next term of parliament. They've run it out for five years as the nationals. He has to get them on side, wouldn't agree. But the Sunday of uh, that going to uh, cabinet, Perrottet and I are working on it. And he got it through. We announced it. I was up there in Sydney with uh, the superintendent of Wesley Mission, Stu, that has the gambling contracts, Stu uh, Cameron. We had congratulated Perrottet. We'd said this is massive. The cashless card kills two birds with the one stone. No criminal will ever again gamble at the pokies because they'll have to have a card that reveals their identity. They'll never reveal that. Linked to a debit account, their own debit, they'll never do that. And the cashless card locks you out for a week. It's Gillard's reforms from back in 2010. The second thing it does is it requires pre-commitment. Before you're in the zone, you will have to set your losses. All the machines will talk to each other, and you can't just go to another venue and lose. You're locked out for a week. We thought Minns, the Labor leader, who's favoured to win, would come out and offer bipartisan support. He did the opposite. He did the opposite. When I talked to Gerard Hayes, Secretary of New South Wales Union, Unions, you heard me right, who's come out for the cashless card. Uh, Binns was freaked by that front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. I talked to him this last week. He said he's so captured still, Tim. He's so terrified of clubs. Look what they did to Gillard. Their power is so enormous. They've got so much in the kitty to spend to get Labor elected up there. If a cashless card wins, if Perrottet wins, or if it's a minority government, either way, because the independents, the Greens are all on our side up there. It will then roll out nationally. Let me explain why. No Premier, south or north of the border of New South Wales, is going to want pokies with cash with crims pouring over the border. It will happen like that. You might have no noticed Dan starting to make some noises about, oh, he's, he's not altogether against the cashless card. <laughs> he's just positioning himself, watching the politics. 
So look, that's a short history. I've gone too long. I'll hand back uh, to you and if there's time for questions, we'll have it. Oh, on online. Sorry. You know, can I say one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. So uh, two weeks ago, uh, Howard, I was calling for the minister, Labor Minister for uh, Communications, Michelle Rowland, to be sacked. Michelle Rowland, who's in charge of um, online, the, Fed, the federal constitution gives the feds communications power. Online is communications power. It was flushed out. She'd taken large donations for her campaign from Sportsbet. Did you see this? Duchess by Tabcor. And suddenly Michelle Rowland, who couldn't see me last year, she was too busy, wanted to see me on Monday. <laughs> and four of her staff, I worked out why. That night she was on Q&A. Monday just gone and she knew she was going to be asked about it. Uh, look, the good thing happening is that we have got up an uh, online inquiry. It's been chaired by Peter Dunkley, Labor member, and, and Woolahan, Keith Woolahan, a Liberal. The submissions are incredible. Australians are sick of the ads. 948 free-to-air ads a day, a day. Spain, Italy have banned, you can, you can bet, but, but no advertising, not allowed. In Britain, there's 12 ads a week. Sports bet ads. We have 948 on free to air a day. That's before you get onto social media and all the other platforms or cable TV. Uh, so that is a fast growing industry. They spend 285 million, the sports bet companies, advertising. That, that makes Jerry uh, Harvey Norman look a pygmy, a pygmy. Uh, so we're putting the asset on there. That, but that's, that's still only a $2 billion industry, rapidly growing and annoys us because we all, our kids, every 10-year-old, 80% of 10-year-olds ten now in Victoria know the logos, the odds, the, the jingles of the sports betting. It's adult product shaping our kids, destroying their minds. As I said uh, to Michelle Rowland, Imagine if 10-year-olds, uh, 80% knew the difference between Peter Stuyvesant and Marlborough and Rothmans, and there'd be outrage. They know this, and this is an adult product. So uh, thank you. I, I didn't quite get there. <laughs> well, I thought we were going to hear about a, a really big problem, but, but wow, we're empowered to do something. <laughs> I feel a little dejected, but also massively encouraged by your enormous energy for this work. We're, we're all very grateful for that work and for coming to share that with us. I know we've gone over time, but I, I, think, I think it's fair to say we don't mind in the slightest. And I think it would be great if there are a couple of two or three burning questions. If you're brave, just walk up to the mic or, or Alex can bring it to you just so the live stream people can hear the questions. Please ask away. I have a bigger question about addiction. Mm. Um, last night we watched a movie that provoked one of my teenage children to say, um, but if they're addicted, they can't help it. And I have a differing opinion. I'm interested in yours. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you, you, I, I always maintain personal agency, personal responsibility. There's always something you can do. So I agree with you on that. But it's a different proposition I'm sort of putting around this addiction. When has the state, as it has with gambling, massively sponsored addiction? When, and this happened you know, with Jeff Kennett, when I was sharing love messages with him in the media when he was Premier, <laughs> literally said, and the Crown Casino represents the spirit of Victoria, we're having a gambling-led recovery. Uh, when every ad that kids are seeing with their heroes, AFL and cricketers, when has the state actually become the sponsor of addiction? Before this happened, John Cain understood this, 
Gambling was consigned to the outer edges. In the police department, it was called gambling and vice. That's what it was called, because you knew it leads to addiction. It doesn't become mainstreamed and brought from the margins and be state-sponsored. So I agree with you, there's always personal responsibility in agency. But where we have uh, gone wrong is a major government promotion of it and cultural promotion of it. Um, thank you. Um, I work within libraries, and so we've got a program called Libraries After Dark, yes, which offers. Great program. Um, great program. It's a it's a drip in the ocean. But are there programs like this that are available around Australia? Opportunities for us to have an alternative mm. to gambling or pokies. You, you've touched on a really uh, profound community issue. So. How did we get into this situation? Because state governments literally said, we can get community on the cheap by giving pokies licenses out. Any greenfield sites development, the first thing that gets licensed is the pokies club. And then they say, so we've, we've, that, that's where they'll get their community. Um, Western Australia, which has no pokies outside a casino, has higher levels of community participation, sporting participation than any of the eastern states. We literally handed over community to get it on the cheap to the pokies venues. And now, Libraries After Dark and others, which are fantastic programs, are offering this, but it's hard to offer a beer at $2. <laughs> and a palmer at 10 isn't it? Because of the monster we created with state governments literally saying, irresponsibly saying, no other country did this. We will get community on the cheap. Um, a personal question. Um, I've got boys who are gamers um, yeah. and they love Fortnite and, you know, a whole lot of different games. I guess the flashing lights and the, mm. you know, is there anything that, any correlation between these sorts of games and pokies and mm. are there, is there a longevity study on mm. what that, you know, mm. how that uh, moves over? Th there is and it's not good. <laughs> Um, so the online inquiry, the House of Reps inquiry, has had uh, very important submissions showing that loot boxes and a whole range of gaming prizes have the industry behind it. See, what happens with gambling is basically you either go bankrupt or you go to jail. That's what happens. That's, that's the end of the road. So they literally are targeting the next generation as fodder with cooperation and research, and it's a pretty black web, this, we don't know all the entanglements with gamers. Absolutely. You've talked about the ga gaming problem and the gambling problem. Is there any money going into supporting people that are addicted, like oh, uh, yeah. counselling services? Yeah, so, so out of the uh, government monies, so basically, the pokies, those who have the, the licences, have to uh, pay a certain percentage that goes to the uh, gambling help services, which is good. Um, it should be much higher, but it's good. The problem is it's, um, you know, it's not building a fence at the top, it's building an ambulance at the bottom. Uh, the, the, the systemic uh, ownership of our whole culture because of this industry. And the nonsense that, oh, well, we have the greatest losses because Australians of all cultures love to gamble. This is complete BS. When I wrote a book back in 2001 a bit, I thought that may be true, that Australians of all cultures are baptised at birth into eucalyptus oil and a, a punt. <laughs> I discovered, as we did the, the book, the Chinese, the Irish, the Kiwis, all boast to be the greatest gamblers on earth. We have the greatest losses because we've got the most irresponsible government policies on earth. Not, it's not cultural. Unless there's one that's absolutely burning. We'll finish that there. But I just want to bring us back to two, two um, points that we can take. Tim mentioned the Alliance for Gambling Reform. 
I would suggest you Google it before you leave the building today and sign up to the newsletter. You don't get bombarded. You receive one every few couple of weeks, I'm, I think. Um, that, I think that's what I receive. Really interesting information. The other thing is there is a push to get pokies into Eltham. And thus far, it seems to be successful. Now, other people in the room will know more about this than me. It seems to be successful to be holding that back. But we in this room need to continue that fight because we can't necessarily have the ear of politicians, but we can have the ear of local people, local politicians. So let's, let's keep up that fight. Thank you again, Tim. We want to um, just give you enormous kudos for everything you're doing and, and enormous thanks for coming today. So thank you. Rose Alba and Alyssa would love to give you a tea or coffee and something to nibble on. So help yourself.